Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. My name is Doug Rock. I'm the publisher of IDM Systems Magazine, and I'm the moderator on today's call. Today's webinar is sponsored by LANSA and is titled Modernization Without Boundaries, Strategies for Your IDMI Applications. We have two presentations for you today that support the topic, the first of which will be given by leading application development strategist Paul Conti. Paul has a lot on his plate, to say the least. He's a software developer, consultant, widely read author in the computer software field. He's a senior technical editor for System I News and president of PCEF an educational and consulting practice in Eugene, Oregon. Paul has consulted and presented seminars to leading enterprises worldwide. He's author or co-author of eight books, including the popular SQL for DB2, and he is widely recognized as an IBM industry expert on database and software development practices. Speaking of people who are in demand, the second presentation today will be given by Lanza product manager David Brault. David has over 15 years of experience in the IBM slash DS400 industry, including extensive involvement integrating IBM I applications with various Windows, Web, and wireless technologies. As product manager at Lanza, David is responsible for launching new Lanza products in North America and serves as the U.S. product line expert for press and analyst briefings. David is also a member of Common America's Advisory Council and frequently speaks at Common and other industry events. For those of you in attendance today, as Jose mentioned, you may submit your questions throughout the presentation via WebEx Q&A service. We will answer those questions as time allows at the end of the session. If for some reason we should run short of time, the appropriate individual will contact you after the session is over. With the introductions and housekeeping covered, We'll kick it off with Paul Conti. Paul, I will now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Doug. And to everyone, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning to talk about uh, one of my in most uh, uh, interested areas, and that's application development strategies. Today I'm going to kick us off by taking a look at a little deeper into modernization and take a look at it from the top down, from the enterprise through the IT to the practice, some of the practical steps. I don't think anybody would dispute that right now we are facing one of the most challenging times in IT. Uh, of course, we're talking about all of these issues in the context of a global economy that's stressed at this point, which puts a lot of pressure on us as IT folks to support our enterprises. Um, we all also recognize that the Internet revolution has really changed the role of application software. It's no longer um, kind of a slow-paced, a supportive role. It's a real key competitive role. Uh, the technologies and skill sets are enormously broader than they have been in the past. Uh, there was a time during the early System 38 days, for those of you that remember back then, that I could keep track of almost every detail of every operating system release and language change. Boy, that's not the case anymore, uh, no matter how hard you try to keep up, it's almost impossible to maintain the breadth of skill that's necessary. And as I mentioned there, the pace of change is not just in the technology, but in the enterprises themselves, um, put a lot of pressure on us as IT folks. Of course, in the uh, global, this global market, there's a lot of change in terms of the business structures, acquisitions, and mergers, and new business initiatives have increased the pressure for applications that run on a variety of platforms. I'm certainly a, a loyal IBM I fan, have been for many years, but we have to recognize that conditions outside of our desires in IT can drive that requirement. And then, of course, we're all familiar with the regulatory and transparency requirements and demands on IT development practices, which mean that we can't uh, ride this like cowboys in the past. We've got to comply with all of those requirements as well. So as I said, a lot of pressure on us in IT. Well, to look at how we might approach modernization, let's start outside of IT. Let's start at a higher level because, after all, we are serving our enterprises. It's what we do. So from the enterprise perspective, um, we can see that modernization it really isn't a question about technology per se. It's essentially what we've always thought in IT, to find better ways to efficiently deliver the right information and capabilities to the right people in the organization at the right time. What's, uh, what we might say characterized as the enterprise, the particular um, view of modernization for the enterprise is the following items. Um, 
the enterprise is looking to improve the application's user interfaces, the ease of navigation, and to have a more integrated and mature approach to applications so that we're no longer in these silos, but we have full interchange and workflow um, practices in our organization supported as well. And then uh, a lot of times we overlook this, but organization, even when they're very aggressive in terms of how they approach their, um, their business, have a very key uh, aspect, which is to reduce risks. In the case of application modernization, the kinds of risks that we need to support the enterprise on are that a new acquisition or some other change will require that plat the new platforms and technologies must be covered. And we've got to cover the risk that the organization won't fail to be able to handle those types of challenges. The other thing, of course, is that many of our enterprises' opportunities and challenges happen in very fast time frames, and the organization needs to be able to respond rapidly to those opportunities or competitive initiatives. And that's something that modernization needs to support from the business perspective. Um, we also, of course, are uh, now looking at requirements from our trading partners for interoperability, in which if we're going to do business with them, we've got to be able to respond to those as well. And finally, from the business's standpoint, throwing away the asset, the incredible, incredibly large value of most organization application assets, uh, is not something that's tolerable from a financial um, or operational standpoint. So from a business-oriented viewpoint of modernization, the key element is to be able to capitalize more fully on the current application assets. So I've broken this down in terms of three core organizational capabilities, and these span both at the across the enterprise and within IT. And these, I would say, are the goals that you can keep in mind for your IT organization or your development teams. One is agility, the flexibility to be able to meet changes, to, be, to meet changing needs quickly. Then reliability. Reliability underlies both agility and productive and productivity. Uh, we need to be able to have timely and stable delivery of required capability. Um, we need to be able to avoid mistakes and delays uh, because not just from the standpoint of consuming um, our, our IT resources, but from the direct and indirect cost of the organization. And as I just alluded to, uh, the reliability is essential in order to minimize the time and resources for repair work, in particular for IT having to go back and rework applications that are failing or not delivering what they're supposed to deliver. And then productivity, of course, is something we've always strove for, and that requires us to keep up with the rate of new demands, which is much, much higher than it has been in the past. So agility, reliability, and productivity are really those fundamental capabilities of the organization. Well, let's move down a level now and look at it more specifically from the IT perspective. From an IT perspective, if we were to say, what are the core features that a so-called modern application would have, this would be my short list. First off, it needs to be able to run on multiple operating systems and middleware platforms. That's something that may not be an immediate need, but in terms of being able to minimize those risks and anticipate those um, changes that may occur, this is certainly a core capability. Multiple user, user interfaces, web interfaces, smart clients, mobile, all of those now are key to extending the reach of the application and the ability for people to fit the application into the way they work rather than vice versa. Workflow and integration support is certainly essential. No more silos. Unified navigation among our applications, and that navigation should be shaped in a way that it fits the way a person works and their needs to serve the enterprise, again, rather than being forced to fit into the structure of the application itself. The workflow integration support, this is a key issue that ties back to that value of our current application assets. It needs to be able to incorporate both the existing applications and their functionality, as well as new applications. And one of the things that we'll also want to extend that workflow integration support to is to third-party providers of both Windows and web components and other types of uh, components that we can use to extend our applications. And then, of course, being uh, uh, oriented towards uh, the engineering aspects and architectural aspects of applications, as I've done for many years, I would point to the fact that one of the things that we're looking for now is a higher quality of engineering based on a sound architecture <clears throat> and a supporting framework. We no longer can be just creating everything from 
scratch in any particular way. We feel like that there needs to be some type of architecture that we have put in place for that, and to serve, and we need to serve that architecture with appropriate frameworks and tools. So another way to look at an IT strategy is to figure that you're looking for a return on investment for your IT efforts and acquisitions. And I think that a, a, a key way to approach this is to assume that if you're looking for those core modern, say, modern application capabilities that I just mentioned, you're going to need to be able to embed both current and new applications into this framework, into this architecture, and then extend those in terms of more functionality and reach. So that means, tying again back to using an application architecture, an architecture in which you're able to create new applications using more advanced technology, better tools, and so forth, but also being able to rapidly take your existing assets and embed them into the same integrated framework. Now, what do I mean by embedding it? What I mean is that applications, old and new applications, have a unified interface, user interface, and they have a, an integrated, unified approach to navigation. I also mean that there can be the cross-use of application functions. So when you write a new application, if there's some function that has already been implemented in an old and existing application, you don't necessarily have to rewrite that from scratch. If you have the, um, uh, in many cases, you have the ability to be able to use just that function in the new application, not just have the entire old application itself kind of in its in its remaining silo in the in your new uh, navigation uh, structure. So being able to to have this cross use of application functions is key. Once we've got ourselves set up to where we can have this uh, integrated approach to our existing and our new application, then we have a, a basis for extending those with additional functions, both in terms of a, a more integration between the old and the new and, and using each other's functions, writing new functions with our new development tools and being able to use those to add reach of capability to both our old and existing function. And then we want to be able to do incremental migration of selected parts of existing applications to new technology. That may give us better capability, uh, easier ability to integrate, easier ability to work with our trading partners and so forth. But what we don't want to have to do is say that, well, we've got to do a uh, one-shot migrate everything over to some new technology. That's simply a, a, a level of effort that most organizations cannot absorb. So if we look at those, so kind of summing that last bit up, what we're looking at is we're trying to look at the most efficient uh, exploitation of our existing portfolio without having to rewrite everything. And we're also looking to have uh, a framework that enables us to rapidly build new applications and exploit functionality that we've already put in place with our old applications. So now we might I've switched gears a little bit here and look at this architecture. What is it that's in the architecture that I've been talking about that gives us that capability? <clears throat> well, first, it's framework-based. The framework really means that it's a set of um, artifacts, such as components, it's a set of tools, and it's a set of standards and procedures that enables us to build things in a consistent, efficient, a well-engineered manner. To do that requires an application repository. It's there's not enough um, ability to integrate and to um, take care of all the other modernization capabilities I talked about if we're hand-coding every application and every program on its own. We need to be able to share information through a repository that's external to the specific executable code, but which gives us the ability to share definitions, resources, procedural bits, and so forth. And as I mentioned, the very first slide, there, the technology is changing so fast now and it's so broad that we need to have an architecture that embodies and, and provides automation and developer guidance uh, so that we're not concentrating on lots of the plumbing type of uh, soft, pieces of software, but we're having our developers focusing on the business aspects of the applications and extending their reach and improving their user interfaces. In order to have this integration, uh, it's pretty key that we have an uh, architecture that supports support service-oriented uh, service application. Now, service-oriented applications really isn't anything that's esoteric. It just means that we need to have a more modular approach in which 
functionality can be shared across different platforms, different languages, and so forth. Then, as I said, quick check off our architecture has got to support multiple platforms. It has to support multiple application interfaces. And it needs us to give us this capability in which we can take legacy applications and we can embed them in this integrated uh, inter user interface and navigational capability. And finally, this architecture can't be a static one-shot, this is how we do it. It's got to enable us to manage application evolution. Now, what does that mean? Obviously, that means we need to be able to change the application. That goes without saying. But we also be able to, need to be able to manage how, what platforms that application runs on, what technology it exploits, and so forth. So that underlying application evolution is also critical to use these pillars. Uh, you'll find on the Lanta website a white paper I wrote about modern application architecture that goes into this in more detail. And we don't have time to dive into it much more here, but I urge you to take a look at that. So if we're going to approach this modernization the way I've discussed it, how do we get there from here? Oh, I'm going to give a few practical tips to this, a little bit of a guide. First off, in my opinion, the silver bullet on effective application development is taking an incremental and iterative approach. Incremental meaning that we can't do everything at once. We try to pick the best bang for the buck. Again, that ROI focus on our development, and we do pieces at a time. Iterative means that we cycle through um, what would have been called in the past analysis, design, implementation. So as we go through that iterative approach, we make sure that we learn what it is that we don't know we don't know, and we can uh, more effectively continue on the next iterations without you know, making some of the mistakes of the past and with taking advantage of things that we learn as we get experience. So the point here is that I don't recommend that you somehow try to adopt a wholesale discard and rewrite strategy. That's simply not practical. Um, when you approach modernization, and this is fairly straightforward, but it needs, they're saying focus on the key pain points or best opportunities for demonstrating concrete return on investment, the old 80-20 principle. When you start into this in particular, look for the successes you can use to build confidence. Success builds on success. That's true in almost every endeavor that I've encountered. So in doing that, um, I would say, Look for exploiting new technologies that deliver concrete value. For instance, if your organization can take advantage of some of the mobile technologies, mobile user interface uh, technologies, that's a good place to look. If it can take advantage of um, mashup types of approaches where you're uh, combining resources that are available from third-party providers, look at that approach. So you want to be sure that, that you're getting something that will deliver concrete value to the enterprise itself, not just changing the interface because it will look better. So you want to be picking, of course, uh, technologies that are lower risk and that, have, that you have better supporting tools and strategies than you do with the current tools and strategies. That's going to give you the ability to show a contrast and, and, and give some additional confidence in your approach. I'm very risk-averse. Um, I've noted that uh, in most successful IT organizations, the ones that um, may deliver 80% or 90% or 75% of what the ideal application would be, but they deliver it reliably on time and in, on, on, within budget, they're the ones that are viewed as successful. So I take a conservative point perspective and say adopt a strategy and, and approach to implementation that minimizes your risk of failure to deliver. Now, the incremental and iterative approach gives you that to begin with. Use the proven best of breed tools. This, again, is one of those things that uh, is, seems to be clear, but isn't necessarily put in practice, and that is we should be leveraging uh, well-supported developers with good tools so that we can exploit the, the top part of the, if you think about it, the kind of the hierarchy of application development pieces, so we don't have our humans working on the plumbing code. We've got our humans working on the difficult business process um, pieces of it. So a little bit more on this. Um, leverage your current analysts and developers. When you really look at it, the greatest asset you have in your human uh, resources is not their knowledge of some particular coding technique, but their knowledge of the business and approaches to designing applications that fit with the business. So you want to be adopting a strategy that leverages your current analysis, not saying, well, gee, we'll just hire an expert on some new technology, and then that will take care of our issues. Now, when you go into a project, you want to be sure that you spend a little bit of time to clearly identify which of these 
four modern application elements you're going to be improving on each particular project or an iteration of a project. So identify very specifically. On this iteration, we're going to work on integrating multiple applications. On this next integration, we're going to work on extending interfaces and so forth. That will give you a much more a much clearer view of what you're going to get in terms of return on the required investment. And final tip is use prototyping as the first step to incorporate the existing application's business functionality. So that's a, uh, then with that iterative and incremental strategy, a prototype gives you that very first increment. You know, it tells you this is what the application, how the application is going to look in its basic functionality. That way you can get early feedback, and as you move forward, you'll be sure you're on the right track. And um, uh, Jose, could you advance my slide here? There seems to be some issue with, with my slide advancing here. Okay. There we go. I've got it. Okay. There was just a, with some uh, WebEx glitch there. So summing up here, is modernization the solution? Well, from my perspective, it's not so important what you call it, but if you take the business-oriented approach that I've just laid out and you build on a solid application architecture, then I really do think it's true that you can get into a new position with your IT organization, which your enterprise can escape the bonds of just being tied to its legacy applications, and you can explore these broad horizons of multiple platforms and high-value technologies. It's not easy. There's a lot of challenges, but hopefully uh, what I provided here will give you a starting point for that. And I uh, appreciate your having me uh, as part of the session today, and Doug, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Paul. David Brault is up next, and then in the way of introduction, I'll let you know that David's presentation is an informative and fun look at the business reasons for deploying an application modernization solution. And I will tell you that at the risk of playing spoiler, Randy Quaid does show up in this presentation in a bathrobe and a winter hat. So consider yourself forewarned. David, if you're ready, I will pass it over to you. Okay. All right, I think we're good to go. Um, just the point I'd like to uh, make is it, when, when my screen shows up, if you don't see it, if it's kind of off the edges, you can always right mouse click on your screen, go to view, and hit the option that says uh, fit to viewer. My screens are a little bit bigger. I apologize for that. So anyway, thanks, Doug, and thanks, Paul. Very informative as usual. Now, staying on the topic of modernizing without boundaries, I, I just want to pick up where Paul left off regarding using a modernization approach that's business-oriented and using frameworks to get you moving in the right direction. So I'd like to kick off the presentation with a quote. Um, I can't remember how or, or why I stumbled across this quote, but after I read it, it, it really stuck, probably because it not only says a lot about life in general, but because it says a lot about, you know, how we live our lives in IT. So James Russell Lowe, he's an American poet from the 1800s, he says that compromise makes a good umbrella, but a poor roof. So what does this say with, um, what does it do with modernization, you might ask? Well, being a member of, of, of IT means that we have to weather storms. So when we see a storm coming, we go out and we buy an umbrella. I use some kind of new technology to avoid getting soaked. Well, the problem is when the next storm comes, we try to reuse that last umbrella, and suddenly things just get out of control because we're trying to use the wrong technology for a, for a new problem. Now, the result is, well, we either get soaked or we end up buying so many umbrellas that eventually our lives are just filled with so many different technologies that they start to get in the way. They actually start to become counterproductive. So when Mr. Lowell says that we need to get a roof, we're talking about getting one technology that will protect us from any kind of storm in the future. Now, that said, we need to make a decision in regards of modernization. We can either stick with the status quo and stagnate, aimlessly driving down the road, or we can be innovative. And we can hop on the Autobahn, you know, to stick with the driving metaphor there, and look at new ways to deliver modern applications to our users that are future-proof and make our end user's job a heck of a lot easier and more productive. Now, here's the problem with, with stagnating. Um, 
Without innovation, the applications that we build to help our company eventually start to hinder our company. And uh, just to set the record straight, stagnation is not caused by neglect. Uh, nobody sets out to stagnate. It's caused, and, and Paul touched on this, it's caused by a combination of avoiding risk and just dealing with the complexity of today's technology. So stagnation means that we're going to continue to take detour after detour because of the limitations found in our current technologies until we finally run into a dead end. And as our friendly Amber Alert sign says, they're good luck because we're going to need it. We're going to need a lot of help getting ourselves out of, out of the situation. So when doing nothing is no longer an option, that's when we need to become innovative. And if we adhere to all the good advice that Paul just gave us earlier, that's when we can start to modernize without boundaries. Keep out and from Lanta, we can modernize without boundaries. So why would you choose RAMP from Lanta to modernize your existing I, uh, IBM I applications? Well, quite honestly, this is what we do. This is what we're good at. Lanta was founded on the discovery uh, of a software development process that significantly reduces the complexity of building, maintaining, and modernizing business applications. And as part of that process, we provide you with some prototyping and some design frameworks that not only kickstart your modernization project, but have limitless potential. And as Paul touched on before as well, because nobody can really, you know, afford to start over from scratch, we're going to let you reuse your current applications and data, but in a much different way than what you're used to. So the modernization approach we'll be talking about today goes way beyond just adding a, a pretty facade to your existing applications. If we draw from our decades of experience in application modernization, we've built a strategy for getting started. We call it a, a repeatable process, if you will, uh, that we've used to help thousands of IDMI organizations improve their applications. And last but not least, we also have a strategy for taking your applications into the future so that, say, 10 years from now, you're not stuck having to make another modernization decision again. So when it comes to modernization, we can't underestimate the importance of strategy. Uh, remembering back to the late 80s, IBM gave us a, uh, a business system strategy in a box. Uh, at the time, they called it the S-400. Obviously, today we call it the IBM I. So IBM, what they did is they made all the important technology and architecture decisions for us. Everything was integrated, the operating system, the database, uh, and all the plumbing it was hidden away from us. We could literally jump straight in and start developing solutions for our business problems. But fast forward a, a decade or two, and life's just not so simple anymore. We've kind of lost our way a little bit, and we need to recapture that strategy that made us fall in love with this platform. And that's what uh, Ramp sets out to do, actually. I don't think it would be a surprise if I were to say that, you know, modernization takes planning. In fact, it's, it's a lot like planning a family vacation across the country. Now, for those of us that have actually done this before, we know that it can either be, you know, the best thing ever or it can be a complete and utter disaster. So to make sure that our next modernization project is not a complete and utter disaster, let's elicit the help from one person that has had some of the worst luck in the history of all family vacations that being uh, one Mr. Clark Griswold. So normally, what I like to do is I like to try to take direction from people that are successful at what they do. But for this instance, we're going to uh, we're going to take a little bit of a different angle. So after watching Clark make a complete mess of something as simple as driving from Chicago to LA, asking him to head up, you know, our next project would be a, quite a tall order. So. We're going to ask him, hindsight being 2020, if you could, you know, if you could do it different, do it all over again, uh, what would you do different? And we're going to then uh, take those answers and apply that to our modernization strategy. So the first thing Clark would tell us would be to create a roadmap. And for us, that means, you know, building that foundation for which all modernization will be built upon. Then he'd tell us to follow directions. Again, for us, that means listening to our end users and getting their feedback early and often. Next, you'd probably advise us to, you know, not only expect the unexpected, but be able to deal with the unexpected and do so in a productive manner. And then he'd recommend that we take shortcuts whenever possible. So in our world, that means streamlining our programs and making our end user's job a lot faster and a lot more productive. And last but not least, Clark would tell us to make sure that we really know what our final destination is before we embark. 
So let's take a look at the first item that Clark suggests, and that's creating a roadmap, i.e. having, you know, this modernization strategy that will improve our application today without being compromised in the future. So, for example, let's give our end users a better way to access their applications. A frequent complaint by 5250 end users is that it's just too difficult to get to the applications they need to use. So the menu that you see on the screen here, uh, this can take on many different looks and fields, and we can now actually authorize which users and which groups of users have access to the menu options, just making, again, their job a little bit easier. Let's provide our users with a better way to search for information. Um, ask them for five or ten different ways that they'd like to search for a customer or a product or an order or, or anything like that. Um, and as you can see here, um, once we do that, they'll be able to, to get access to the data in a much more productive way than before, given to them all in one spot. Now, once the user has found the item that they're looking for, let's enable them to do more with it. So let's bring all the scattered information about that item together onto a single screen, just separated by tab sheets. Now, these tab sheets, they should be able to display information from various sources, you know, from, from green screens buried deep inside of our legacy applications, uh, web pages, .NET applications, um, additional information that's just stored in DB2 or maybe even SQL tables located uh, physically on, on a different server. Now, most important for us, Developers, we want to make sure that all the plumbing code that's required to, you know, connect all these areas together is already done. So developers, and, and Paul touched on this, developers tend to waste time. I don't want to say waste, but, you know, I think you'll know what I mean after we get through. But they tend to waste time writing this plumbing code. And this plumbing code adds little or no business value to the application. So let's just stop doing that. And Paul also talked about... You know, having a sound architecture with a supporting framework. And that said, RAMP architecture has everything we just talked about already built in. So before developers even write their first line of code, something's already in place. So what we're left with is this unified application framework that can handle a mixture of legacy applications, new components, and just disparate information running, you know, all inside of a single application. And just like when the AS400 was introduced, RAMP's all about bringing back, you know, the architecture in the box so we can jump in and start creating business applications right away once again. Now, moving forward, Clark, again, he told us that we need to do a better job <coughs> following directions, and that's pretty ironic coming from a guy who consistently makes very poor decisions. But that said, he's right. We need to get direction from our users and listen to what they have to say because last time I checked, our job is, is supposed to be building applications for them. As developers, we think differently. We think more programmatically, whereas the end users don't. So we need to value what they have to say, value their input, because they may offer insight into how a business process could work better in a way that we, we may have, ne have never have thought of. And that said, we're going to now follow the directions from our end users to create our business roadmap. So how do we create this roadmap? Well, RAM provides us with a, a special prototyping wizard that will take care of generating the application's infrastructure for us. So that's integrating, you know, all those pieces of the puzzle that we just talked about moments before. Now, what's cool about the prototyping process is we design in a conceptual process that, that pretty much parallels how end users think. So suddenly we're designing using business terms and actions like for customers I want to see orders, and for products I want to see documents and notes, and instead of the, designing it, you know, the way we normally do, where we're talking in technical terms of record formats and screen layouts and sub-procedures and et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's also cool about this process is we have the opportunity to start with a clean slate. So we can now prototype, you know, a brand new application with our end users sitting right next to us and do so without looking over our shoulders and worrying about how our existing 5250 applications they hit today. We just design the application that our, that our end users need and we let RAMP worry about how we're going to retrofit all of our legacy applications after the prototyping phase is complete. So here's what the prototype looks like after you run through the wizard. Uh, what I want you to notice is that most of the components are now in place. So, for example, uh, the prototype automatically created this menu structure that just makes a lot more sense to our end users, and there's uh, no coding there for us. Uh, right here inside the search panel, 
we can literally plug in as many different search components as we want just by running through uh, some of wizards, which means we can provide an endless number of ways that our users can search for data without us having to write anything from scratch. Now, the search results here with the red check is um, users now have the ability to, you know, move, work with data. So they can move, move the columns around. They can sort the data by clicking on the column heading. And they can now work with the data in a way that's just more meaningful to them. Now, this, again, this functionality is part of the RAM framework. No development is required. And down here, this is where the real magic happens. So these tab sheets contain every piece of information that's related to an item. So in this case, uh, the end user told us for any given customer, they want to be able to see their details, their address information, uh, internet security, order information, et cetera, et cetera. So we plugged all that data into the wizard, and then the wizard generated all these tabs for us. Now, at this point in time, we're not too worried about, you know, where this customer information is going to come from. All we really care about is making sure the user has all the tabs they need to consolidate all the information for a given customer so they can be more uh, productive at their job. Now, before we leave this screen, um, most people associate the word prototype with the, with the phrase throwaway. And I just want to emphasize that this prototype actually evolves into the finished application. It is not a throwaway. Now, speaking of throwaways, there are, honestly, there are going to be parts of your application that your end users will probably never, ever want to see again, sort of like how Clark never wants to see Eddie again. So for this example, we're going to use Eddie to illustrate how RAMP allows you to still follow the directions from our end users, but get rid of all the unnecessary uh, parts of our applications. So imagine this is the uh, application flow for one of our uh, programs. And the end users tell us that um, they need to see information that's located down here on the screen where the red check is. Okay, so, um, but they also tell us that they, they don't want to see any of the screens prior to that red check because they're just extra steps. Now, again, following the directions of our users and sticking with the Griswold metaphor, notice how happy the Griswold family is here before they started their trip. In order to keep them happy, we can't make them go to all those other unnecessary stops. Enter Cousin Eddie. So what we're going to do is we're going to send Eddie off to all those different locations because, quite honestly, nobody cares if Eddie ever comes back. So by sending Eddie out instead of the family, we can now record the navigation path to that final screen so that our end users never have to see them. Okay? So the family is happy because they get to go to where they wanted to and nobody's had to see Eddie. Now, since the users have direct access to the information that they need, obviously they're going to become more productive because they're only going to use the screens where they actually perform work. And now that the navigation path has been recorded, we can take that and snap that inside of RAMP, and our end users honestly probably won't even realize they're using parts of the old system because all that navigation is, in fact, hidden from them. So to see how this is done, uh, let's return to our prototype. Notice here on the, uh, the details tab that it's still basically an empty placeholder. So to fill it with an existing 5250 application, we toggle over to the um, over to the navigation wizard, and then we start to walk through the application right here where the red check is, just like an end user would. Over here on the right hand side, this is uh, this is our call stack, if you will. It's basically a graphical representation of all the screens that we've traveled thus far. So we know that this screen is a final a final screen because the bottom box is color coded green. Green means it's the final destination. All the other colors represent different types of navigation screens. So now how that's determined is over here on the left hand side, we simply tell Rams as we walk through the application, is this screen navigation or is this screen a final destination? Now, once we've recorded the process, we simply click over on the Details tab and then select which tab sheet that we want to have this last final screen appear in. And then we close it out, and we're all done. And once we get back to our prototype, what I want you to notice is that the, um, the uh, Customer Details tab now has that application running inside the tab sheet. Now, I just want to point out, we didn't have to write a single 
line of source code to, to, to have that final destination string appear inside the RAMP prototype. And we're able to do this without changing any of our existing applications. Plus, it has been, Paul touched on this earlier before, if we, let's say we decide we want to replace this, uh, this tab, this legacy screen with, with a new component, it's really, and you'll see this uh, in, in a little bit, it, it's, it's quite easy to swap this out and move the application forward into the future. Now, better yet, um, in an effort to help make these legacy 5250 screens feel like a modern application, end users can go from any one final destination screen to another. And again, without seeing the dozen or so navigation screens in the middle that are required to get there. And this kind of goes back to Paul's point about, you know, efficiently delivering the right information and capabilities to the right people at the right time by simply improving the user interface and the navigation. Going back to our details tab here, um, this tab knows obviously which set of information to display thanks to our family, uh, our end users, and it knows how to reach that final destination screen uh, thanks to Eddie. And since the data that's uh, in the search results above is actually used as part of the navigation script, um, if an end user clicks on a different customer inside the search results uh, section, the details tab automatically refreshes that tab with the new customer information without the end user seeing you know, all the F12 keys and subfile navigation, etc., cetera, to, to, to make that happen. Every journey, um, I think anybody who's been a, a, on this planet for a while has realized that every journey has unexpected twists and turns. And uh, for some people, they can handle the pressure better than others. So let's, let's learn from Clark's ineffectiveness to deal with the unexpected so that we can stay on track and reach our, our final destination pretty much unscathed. Now, for the Griswold family, dealing with the unexpected probably meant them dealing with Clark wanting to stop off at every tourist trap along the way and obviously jeopardizing them reaching their final destination. Well, the same thing holds true in terms of modernization as well. Once the 5250 shackles finally come off, we're just bound to fall in love with some new features that we can never have before. And we're going to be very tempted to alter our plans to get some of these new features into the first release of our application. You know, things like, you know, Excel downloads, Microsoft Word integration, .NET integration, uh, converting uh, PDFs into uh, school files into PDFs, document management, dashboards, and really the list goes on and on. Well, this new feature, Love Fest, uh, is also known as Scope Creep. And from my experience, Scope Creep has killed more than its fair share of projects. And with RAMP, what we can do is we can minimize Scope Creep because a lot of the features that I just mentioned here on the screen are just already built into the RAMP framework. So as I mentioned before, uh, RAMP provides us with a bunch of additional features that we can snap into the framework that require either very little coding or no coding at all, which again keeps scope creep at bay, and enables us to effectively deal with the unexpected. So now that we're looking at our prototype, which has now evolved into a finished application, let's take a look at some of the features we now have available to us. So for example, when our users right mouse click anywhere in the search results panel, they can select a, an option at the bottom that will send all that data in there to Microsoft Excel. So as developers, we don't write a single line of code for that functionality. It's just built into the framework and requires no coding on our part. Looking back down at the tab sheets here, we're, again, we're currently looking at that details tab, which was that final uh, legacy destination screen that we stopped in just before. But when we click over here on, say, like the Maps tab, we're now looking at uh, Google Maps integration. We simply pass the customer address over to Google Maps, and Google takes care of mapping that data for us. The next tab, which is called Website, this is actually running a complete web application inside of this tab. It doesn't matter if it's written in PHP or ASP or JSP or just plain old HTML. What's cooler yet, data, again, from the search results above can be used to navigate this web application to a specific page, like a specific product or to a particular order. Again, this helps reduce the effort that our users have to exert to locate information that they're after. Now this tab here, this is called, this is RAMP's document management component. And with this tab, users can now view, they can update, they can store any kind of document in DB2 back on the IBM I server, and then associate it to specific customers or products, orders, or any other kind of data they store back in a database. As a developer, there's absolutely no coding or changes to our database required to add this functionality. 
And honestly, our customers, they absolutely love it. Um, they can finally link their unstructured data to their structured data and have it all be stored back in DB2 and now be included as part of their, their nightly and their weekly backups. Now, another feature that um, requires note development is the notes tab here. So similar to the documents tab, you can now start adding notes to any customer or product or order that's stored back in your database. And again, no changes to the existing, uh, existing files are required. Developers just snap it in, and without running a single line of code, they have that functionality for their application. A feature that our executives and our power users love to have is something that we call an executive dashboard. So this is a screen that displays all the key performance indicators that they need to make business decisions. So Lanta provides the core functionality of this dashboard, and then we just have to map all the gauges and all the graphs back to our data. Now, Paul mentioned the need to be agile and flexible. So let me show you how easy it is to add a new feature to the RAMP application. So this entire framework is property-based, which means uh, to make a change, you simply go into the settings of the application to change how the application behaves. Now, the reason why we have all these tab sheets available for a customer is because they all reside in the enable column, the second column there on the right. Um, they were put there by the prototyping wizard. So if we need to add another tab and for, for some functionality to this application, we either go back to the prototyping wizard or we simply drag an item from the not enabled column to the enabled column, and voila, we have a new tab. Now that all that's left to do is really just tell that tab where to get the content from. Is it going to come from a 5250 final destination stream? Is it going to come from a web page? Will it be a Lancet component? Will it be a .NET component? And we're done. Very straightforward, very flexible, and very agile, and no coding. So the fact that the framework is so flexible means that we can keep adding new features and just continue to, uh, continue to extend the application for many, many years to come. Another thing Clark recommends is that we take, um, we take shortcuts whenever possible. Now, even though his shortcuts always ended in disaster, we're, we're going to kind of take that with a grain of salt here. So what I think he's trying to say is we need to find ways to streamline how our legacy applications behave today. If you think about it, many of today's application procedures are very complex. How we bill a patient, uh, the steps that are required to create an order, how we receive, you know, truckloads of products into our inventory system, et cetera, et cetera. All these types of processes often involve interacting with, with several parts of an application, if not several uh, applications. Now, quite often, we hear users complain how it takes them, you know, it takes me 20 screens to complete an order, uh, even more if it's complex. Uh, these are prime examples of when we need to create a shortcut. So with that in mind, RAMP enables companies to automate complex application procedures by processing several final destination screens sequentially in order to complete a transaction. So for example, we can create a brand new component that gathers all the information that's required for a process, like so let's say uh, creating an order. And then when the user comes down here to the bottom of the screen and clicks on the, uh, the process button, RAMP will take care of executing all of those legacy 5250 screens that we saw on the screen before to complete that task. So in essence, we're building a brand new tab sheet with, better, with a better interface for the end user, but we're still reusing what we have today. And most important, without having to modify our existing programs. Now, it's this part of RAMP's technology that enables companies to remove the boundaries of their previous business applications, again, without disrupting their current procedures. Now, if we one, one more time refer back to what Paul had to say earlier, this technique allows us to address key pain points, and this is our best opportunity to achieve, you know, the best return on our, on our, return on our investment uh, by streamlining the 20% of the applications that are used 80% of the time by our end users. So how much time and money can be saved? Well, let's take a look at what one of our customers was able to accomplish by streamlining their applications with RAMP. So the customer is called Stratech Security Corporation. They're headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They are the world's largest producer of automotive locks and keys. And they use RAMP to streamline their shipment and inventory deliveries. Now, just think about how tough it's been on the automotive industry in the last, you know, 
four or five years, and you'll definitely understand why they need to cut costs wherever and whenever they can. So the first project that they worked on was a way to automate how they processed their delivery. So even though they had an ERP system, which I believe was uh, JBA System 21, they had an ERP system to allocate these items, but even though they're using quote-unquote technology, it was still a very manual and very time-consuming process. So the result is they were able to reduce the average back order re or reallocation processing time from 162 minutes down to 24 minutes. That was an 85% reduction in the handling time, and obviously that's just a huge cost savings for them. So this remarkable process improvement was achieved without having to change a single line of their JBA um, System 21 source code. Now, this initial success was quickly followed up by some other projects that revolved around areas like order to invoice cycling time and their outgoing product quality. So they achieved similar gains in those areas, too, and actually covered some of the, some of the uh, core goals that Paul talked about in terms of, you know, having reliability and productivity. So, for example, their invoice cycle time was reduced by 80%, which improved their productivity, and... Um, their outgoing product quality errors was reduced by 65%. So that obviously helps in the reliability of their business systems. Here's a quote from Nick over at Stratech. He says, the money that we saved from our first project paid for the RAMP software in one year. So they've done many projects since, and just that very first project alone was able to get you know, first-year ROI out of using that technology. So what do you think the value would be for your organization if, say, after just a few weeks of development and literally no changes to your underlying system, you were able to achieve very similar gains? I would guess probably enough value to justify the, uh, the investment you went up many times over. Now, the last piece of advice that Clark gave us was to understand our destination. And again, this sounds obvious to those of us with, with common sense, but for our friend Mr. Griswold here, he thought that getting to Wally World was his final destination, which was wrong, right? What is right is, is being able to spend quality time with his family at Wally World. That was actually his destination. So sadly, Clark didn't realize this until uh, till he actually got to the park and discovered it was close for repairs, and in typical Clark Griswold fashion, he was uh, not happy about this. So if you're asking, what does this have to do with modernization? Well, there's so many companies out there that feel they need to modernize because they want to have a Windows or a web version of their 5250 applications. That is not the destination. <clears throat> Your destination should be building applications that your users will like and will use and be more productive because of it. Whether it's web or Windows, that's just part of your deployment checklist. It's, it's not the end result per se. So with RAMP, we can focus on building better applications for our end users and then let RAMP worry about deploying, you know, via a, a Windows with client interface or via a web browser. And as you can see here, these two screenshots, uh, the Windows version on the left and the web version on the right, they look nearly identical. So which really allows us to focus on functionality, not on deployment. And later on down the line, you can now start to replace all the legacy components, so all those task sheets, if you want to stop using your legacy RPG, do so at your own pace. And now, once you've done that, you have a fully multi-platform application, just like Paul discussed earlier, you know, we don't want you to move off the eye, but if God forbid you have to, at least you haven't thrown away all your, your development efforts for the last uh, couple decades. Now, one last item that Clark did not add to his checklist is choosing the best vehicle for your journey, probably because he didn't. Now, all joking aside, RAMP is the best modernization vehicle that, that I've ever seen that really allows us to modernize our IBMI application without boundaries. Now, I've been in IT for over 15 years, and I've seen departments go down in flames because they just try to bring in so much, so many different tactical solutions that only address certain situations or certain requirements. I've also seen the opposite happen, too, where companies try to, you know, they try to do the big bang approach, but that just leaves big holes, and, and a lot of those projects tend to fail as well. Now, it's RAMP. There's a lot less moving pieces for us to worry about because, you know, the, the framework insulates us from, from all the groundwork that it provides. And it shields us from having to build custom applications and, more importantly, all that plumbing code that's required to pull it off. 
So don't settle on the technology that you're going to use as you start to take your applications into the future. Now, another thing that I've found in my uh, 15 years of experience is that it takes more than just great software to uh, forge a long-term relationship, uh, in term, uh, a business relationship. So when people choose Lanza, they're not just buying a tool to do a job. They're buying a solution to meet a particular business need. And I can't emphasize enough how well Lanza understands modernization. It comes from doing this type of work every day, week after week, 52 weeks a year. And now we have a repeatable formula based on our past experience that we can now use to help make your modernization process a success. So when you acquire a ramp from Lanza, what you're doing is you're building on proven and mature technology. We've been around uh, since 1987. Uh, and uh, besides that, you're also joining a worldwide community that spans, you know, 7,000 organizations and uh, 55 different countries. So the Lanza community, the nice little tip here, the Lanza community, actually helped shape, shape the direction of our platform. And a lot of our best product ideas come from our customers. So we, we take your feedback and we put it into our products. Some of our customers um, are very independent. And honestly, they'll only call our support desk at a last resort. On the flip side of that, some of our customers, they don't even have an IT department. And they heavily rely on us and a professional services group. But a majority of our customers, they fall somewhere in the middle. Okay, so our goal for our customers is to make them as independently success, as successful at whichever level they feel most comfortable. That is our goal with our customers. And getting start, started with any potential new customer can begin on many different new levels. We, as I mentioned before, we are modernization experts, and we're more than, more than happy to share our experiences with you, which actually brings me to um, the next slide here. The last item I want to cover today is a promotion that Lance is currently running called the, uh, the Ramp Test Drive. Uh, it's funny, in life we're taught that, you know, it's all about the journey, it's not the destination. Well, that's not true in IT. In fact, too many long journeys to reach a destination and, and you're probably out of a job. So in an effort to help you verify that Ramp is in fact the correct path, Lancer wants you to feel as confident as we do that Ramp can modernize your applications. We're, we're already confident. We, we've done this hundreds of times before, and we're willing to share our experiences with you. So if this is your first attempt at modernization, maybe your Ramp test drive is a, a private demo or a, or a free personal modernization analysis with one of our modernization specialists. If this is not your first attempt at modernization, maybe your ramp test drive is, is something more substantial, like kicking off a proof of concept or a pilot project where we participate with you on site and we install the software for you and, and we actually build a working ramp application over your live data and applications. So if you're interested in participating in or learning more about the ramp test drive, you can just check it out at lanta.com forward slash test drive. And don't worry, I will put the uh, URL up uh, uh, one last time at the end of the presentation, which is now. <laughs> so before I uh, uh, pass control back to Doug for Q&A, I just want to point out, again, uh, we've already run past our time, so we'll just answer a couple questions. But Paul and I uh, will stick on stick around for a while and uh, after the session ends and continue to answer questions uh, via the uh, Q&A chat facility. Also, if you have any questions specific to Paul, uh, please reference Paul's name somewhere in the questions so those questions can get routed to him. Otherwise, I'm going to take my best stab at answering that question. Also, I have all the lamp to contact information up on the screen right now. Feel free to contact us at 630-874-7071. Uh, you can email us at info at or you can go to uh, lancer.com forward slash test drive if you're interested in learning more about the RAMP test drive. So with that, Doug, I'll, I guess I'll pass it back to you. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, considering uh, where we're sitting from a time perspective, we do have a few questions. Dave, I can, um, they're, they're all um, specific to you and to RAMP. So if you're ready, I can go ahead and, and ask you a few of these. Sure. Um, what new skills or languages will I need to learn to use your product? Uh, that's, that's, a very, that's a very good question. And, and the answer really depends on, you know, what your plans are going to be for the product, because the majority of the RAMP application itself can be built without any program. So the prototyping phase requires no coding and thus no new skill sets. The, the filters that you generate for your search components, those are built using wizards as well. Uh, the search results panel, that's just built into the framework that you have to use a wizard for that. Um, 
so that, you know, that requires no coding as well. Um, so the process to pull all those, those good streams, those final streams into the ERP, from your ERP into the ramp, again, that's done with the wizard, so there's no coding there. So I guess the only time you need to, to learn a new language would be when you want to be, extend the application beyond just grabbing your existing streams um, or running through wizards, obviously. So if you want to write an extension in Lancer or .NET, obviously you would have to know um, one of those languages. But honestly, if you know CL, you can code in Lanza. Uh, Lanza's coding syntax is very similar to CL. It, it, it's a tool for IBM I developers, so it's not this, uh, you know, mammoth OO-centric tool. It, it's built for IBM I developers to be able to build incredible applications without having to become uh, Java developers. Um, and of course, I guess I guess the last part of the question, you can always continue to write your extensions in RPG and just snap them inside of RAM. Uh, but obviously, I think people want to get away from uh, um, continuing to just write more and more RPG for, for their uh, future applications. Okay, so it sounds like most time series shops can get up to speed fairly quickly. Yes. Uh, second question, how is RAM different than just screen scraping my 5250 programs? Well, we, we feel RAMP is very different uh, when compared to refacing. Some of the some of the biggest differences between RAMP and screen scraping is one, obviously, the prototyping uh, and the framework. That's going to really kickstart your modernization project by providing you know, all that plumbing and all those features that we talked about today uh, that you need for modern applications. And you don't you don't get that with screen scraping. Also, you know how you reuse your existing applications and databases is a lot different than refacing because. RAMP's going to provide you with, you know, better ways to search for items and just removes all the complexity of how you navigate from, from one screen to another. Um, obviously, with screen scraping, you're still going to have to walk through the, the same 25 screens that are required to, to complete an order, whereas you, now with RAMP, you could actually uh, bring that down to one. So um, not only will it look better, but it's just going to behave better and make your job a lot easier. Uh, also, when it comes to, you know, comes time to, to add new components, RAM provides a way to fill in all the gaps with, with new technology where refacing always requires a 5250 screen to be, be able to display any kind of information. And last, I guess you could say uh, really maybe the most important is RAM provides co uh, companies with, with a future pass. Right? That's, that, that's just not available to refacing. With RAM, if you wanted to, after you plug in all your screens into RAM, all your 5250 screens into RAM, as I mentioned before, you could eventually replace every one of those tabs with a new component that no longer relies on your existing 5250 application. So with screen scraping, you always need those 5250 screens. So with, uh, with RAMP, you don't. And if, if multi-platform for the, uh, uh, you know, for the, for the risk averse out there who want to know that, you know, if, if the eye has to go away for some reason and you want to be protected in the future, once you've gone through and replaced all those tabs with, with different components, you're not, you now open yourself up to all of Lanza's multi-platform and multi-interface capabilities. Okay, so there's some future proofing capabilities that are built in there. Um, third question, my application vendor went out of business and I don't have any source code. Can I still use your RAMP tool? Yes, you can. Uh, RAMP is going to work with any 5250 application. Uh, even though it's about source code, it doesn't matter if it was written in COBOL or RPG, it doesn't matter. It physically runs the application, so it doesn't have to, like, you know, go through your RPG code and look at stuff, analyze stuff. It just physically executes the application. So as long as the program still runs, you're going to be able to uh, run through it during the, using the navigation wizard, tell RAMP which streams are navigation versus uh, final destinations, and then once you've done that, just say plug it into the RAMP framework, then you're done. So, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, if your company's out of business, you don't have source code, you'll still be able to uh, reuse those inside of uh, the RAMP um, interface. Very good. Last question. Is a Microsoft Windows Server required to run this? No, you don't need a Windows Server. Uh, none is required for RAMP. Uh, but that said, if you, like, I mean, in today's day and age, I mean, a lot of companies have Windows Servers, and a lot of those servers actually have data sitting on it. So if you have data sitting on a Windows Server, even though the RAMP application doesn't require a Windows Server to be deployed, uh, just your, your eye, um, the RAMP application can go out and read and display that information from your Windows box and put you know put it in a tab sheet right next to one of your legacy green screen 5250 programs. So no, you don't need it, but uh, if you got data out there sitting on it, we can definitely pull that in and bring it along. Okay, that sounds good. So if anybody has some additional questions going forward, you obviously have all the contact information up on your last slide. 
Um, with that, I know we are running over, so I just do want to say I appreciate everyone in attendance for participating in today's webinar, and I especially want to thank Paul and, and Dave for sharing their expertise again. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.